This is the emblem of Ford motor cars, familiar to all. Now look at the first logo of the Soviet Gaz car. Are they similar by chance? Of course not. The plant in Nizhny Novgorod was built during Stalin's era by Americans. And look at another pride of Stalinist industrialization, the famous Magnitka. The master plan for the Magnitogorsk metallurgical plant was originally copied from a similar American plant in Indiana. The power plant was built by the Germans with equipment supplied by the British. One more thing, what would the world-famous American company General Electric do to electrify the Soviet Union? Just put their turbines on the Dnieper hydroelectric power plant. How, at a time when the Soviet Union was isolated from the rest of the world, was it going to build and produce everything by itself? Does it remind you of anything? Key factories and the future pride, industrial giants designed and built by the hated world bourgeoisie. So was the economy of the USSR really so independent from the rest of the world? Here comes 1929. The United States is ahead of the rest of the world. Their economy is growing, cities and skyscrapers are popping up, and people are partying. It's just like a fairy tale, just like in The Great Gatsby. The buildings were higher. Parties were bigger. And here comes a global economic crisis they called the Great Depression. This, as they say, is what happens when there is a crisis of overproduction. And then the overvalued stocks of all the companies go to hell. The factories and steamships collapse, nothing is built anywhere, millions of Americans were left without work or even sometimes food. And here we have the Soviet Union where they had just shut down the free economic shop they called the NEP. The plan was to accomplish the great feat of industrialization. But to build factories, there were not enough materials, technology, or especially experience. And all of this was available in the West. And their workers and engineers desperately needed work and money. Remember, they were in the Great Depression. So Russia, even though it was Soviet Russia, even if it was not recognized by official American diplomacy, became a new land of opportunity. Just to make things clear for you, the Americans were really among the last to recognize that such a country as the USSR actually existed. And they established diplomatic relations with Moscow only in 1933, when Gaz and Magnitogorsk and Nepragesk had already been built. In the meantime, 2,000 companies and 20,000 foreign engineers and workers were coming to build socialism. Stalin himself would later tell the American ambassador Harriman that two-thirds of all major Soviet enterprises were created, so to speak, with the help of American might. Among them was Henry Ford's company. He was the first in the world to put automobiles on the assembly line, and the Soviet Union needed both cars and assembly lines. So there was a lot of interest in Russia for Ford. Ford, on the other hand, was interested in money. Back in 1925, the Ford organization sold 12,000 company tractors to the Soviet Union, and along with that, the license to produce them. The license was used to assemble Farzon Putilovitz tractors at the Krasny Putilovitz plant in Leningrad. And in general, it was not surprising that the American capitalist in the spring of 1929, even before the Great Depression, agreed to a profitable contract, which in times of crisis wouldn't even become an obstacle. No matter where industry thrives, whether it's in India, China, or Russia, more profits will be made for all of us. Yes, the whole world should only benefit from it. It is not clear what kind of benefit the world gets out of Ford building the Gorky auto plant, but Ford certainly benefits. The USSR would buy $30 million worth of parts from the Americans, while Ford itself would be losing $60 million a year on its American production during the crisis. So it's not surprising that the plant in Nizhny Novgorod would be built in just 18 months, and the assembly line in the American image would start up on January 1st, 1932. Let me remind you that the number of automobiles we had was less than in such countries as then Nizhny Novgorod would be renamed Gorky, and the name Gaz, Gorky Automobile Plant, would appear. The cars, by the way, were not simply blindly copied in Russian Detroit. So here is a Ford A, and here is a Gaz A. Find the differences. You must adapt the Fords to go on Soviet roads, and more often than not, the lack of them. That is to say, something to simplify somewhere, something to strengthen somewhere else. In the end, by 1935, Ford and the Soviet Union ended their collaboration. But the Soviet Union does not end up being inspired by the American Ford products. Here is the iconic Soviet car, the Volga Gaz 21. 
And here is the famous Ford Mainline. Of course, the USSR denies the slander of plagiarism and says that the Volga is no more like Ford than any other good car of those years. Although it is well known that the Gorky automobile plant buys the Ford Mainline and other good foreign cars of those years for study. But plagiarism would never be proven, and nobody is forbidden to be inspired by something. Now let's meet this smiling man, Albert Kahn. In America, he is known as the architect of Detroit, the Motor City, because he designs the headquarters of General Motors, the Detroit Police Building, and in general, he builds the plants for the big three Detroit automakers, Chrysler, General Motors, and Ford. But do you know who he makes the most money on? The USSR. That's where he ends up with a lack of contracts and a threat of bankruptcy. Again, you can be as good as an American architect as you want, but when the country is starving, it has no time for big construction. Although this was never a problem for Soviet Russia. Kahn and his crew would build 500 plus factories over the course of industrialization. Here's a map of the Soviet Union, and here's a map of Kahn's facilities. So, it turns out, he is the unofficial American father of the military industrial complex of the Soviet Union. Among his creations is the famous Stalingrad tractor plant. Kahn would initially build it in the United States, but then he would dismantle it, load it on 100 transport ships, and take it to the USSR, where he would reassemble it in just six months. Of course, a few years of such production construction bring Kahn good money, and it cost the Soviet Union 2 billion rubles. Today, that is almost 250 billion dollars. And here's the question, why is there so little talk about the man who essentially designed the industrialization of the USSR? Where are the streets named after him in Russian cities? Because it is commonly believed that the enthusiasm of the Soviet man defeated the capitalist engineering experience, you must agree, in such an environment, a large number of foreigners at a socialist construction site spoils the picture. So their work was never advertised. Even the Russian branch of Khan's firm had the correct name, so to say. No Albert Kahn and Associates Incorporated here, but simply Gos Projekt Stroy. World War II. The Soviet Union and naturally its entire industry lived under the slogan, everything for the front, everything for victory. And according to Soviet statistics, every third shell and every second tank in the USSR was made from Magnitogorsk metal. That is, from the same plant which 10 years earlier the American company Arthur G. McKee & Company of Cleveland, Ohio would start to design. The master plan of the plant would be to make an enlarged copy of this plant, the U.S. Steel Corporation in the state of Indiana. 800 foreign specialists would come to the construction in Magnitogorsk. The central power plant would be built by the German AEG company. The Germans from Krupp and Reismann would take care of the refractory production, and the British from Taylor would take care of the mining production. And of course, Albert Kahn would also be involved. His specialist from Gosprecht Stroy would also design a key plant of Soviet industrial power. Of course, Soviet engineers learn very quickly from foreign help, and enthusiasm takes over all builders from all over the country, so that they were breaking every conceivable record at breakneck speeds for construction. The very same Americans don't believe that Magnitka can be built in just a couple of years. You want to rush at full speed. You're in too much of a hurry. The biggest steel plant in the world, our American Harry, took 12 and a half years to build. Add another 11 years for its design, and you hope to launch this plant in three years. In the end, American predictions would not come true. Magnitka would really be built and launched within three years. But, however, the hero managers of this labor enterprise exploited the Soviet citizens. Google, Maryasin, and Valerius were all shot by the end of the 1930s. In fact, there would have been no industrialization if there had not been any mutually beneficial cooperation. Sometimes, as they say, business and nothing personal is a benefit for all. And yes, neither now nor then, no economy in the world can produce everything on its own. You either have to buy something from somewhere, or what you produce must be sold to someone else. Everything else is a convenient myth, molded by propaganda. Later, you raise your kids on this myth. Check out the interviews of these Soviet children and what they think of Americans that they have never, ever met. When I was a kid, I thought all they thought about was launching nuclear missiles. Actually, no, they're not belligerent. And even on the contrary, here, they did well to open a restaurant in our Soviet Union. Yes, that's how they opened the first McDonald's in Russia in 1990. And within 30 years, there would be 850 times as many such restaurants. This format would show how to do modern catering, inspiring a bunch of entrepreneurs inside Russia to create their own restaurants and fast food chains. 
and the local McDonald's themselves would be considered some of the best and cleanest in the world. Because honest competition never makes anyone worse off. Cooperating with others gives you the opportunity to do your own better. And isolation and self-isolation will only lead to stagnation and self-destruction. Work for yourself and work for your tomorrow, boldly stepping into the future.